moderating this panel with me is João Coelho, also from Malena Institute, who's keeping up with uh, the discussion online as well. And acting as a reporter online, we have Julia Mendonça. Good morning, Julia from Data Privacy Brazil Research, organization which is co-hosting this workshop uh, with Alana. And here on site, we have Thais Rugolo, also from Alana. So to warm up a little of the discussion we're proposing, I'd like to present some context elements, uh, starting with the predominant business model in the digital services, which has, from the past years, been based in massive data collection for profiling users and targeting them with personalized ads. A recent report launched by Human Rights, Rights Watch points out that most ad tech apps and platforms are also inserted in this data economy model. Many of them uh, collect student data and sell it to third parties, such as the data brokers exploring the personal data uh, collected against should best interests. interests. <laughs> Uh, if this ad tech industry has been rapidly uh, growing, the COVID-19 pandemic pushed it even forward um, as it forced governments and schools all around uh, the world to adopt remote learning strategies which are, were led up uh, all students, including children. At the same time, children's rights standards vocalize their right uh, to full education and their right to having their data uh, handled, handled according to their best interests. The consideration of children's student data as an asset, however, however, is largely unregulated, especially in the global south, where data protection regulations in general are student recipient. Standing from this scenario, uh, we need to discuss how the current predominant ad tech model affects students' priv privacy as well as alternatives that are more respectful to their rights. So to kick things off, I will give the floor to Hai Jung Han, the researcher responsible for the important report named How Dare They Peep Into My Private Life from Human Rights Watch. So Han, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, could you start giving us a um, kind of overview of the edtech industry and privacy invasion reality? Please, you have the floor and 10 minutes. Wonderful. Can I just do a quick mic check to make sure everyone can hear me and see me okay? Thumbs up? Okay. Wonderful. So, hi everyone. It really is an honor and pleasure to be here with you today. And as you know, over the past few months, and soon in the next few months, millions of students have and will return to school in a new academic year. And they're largely using technology that was adopted during the pandemic. So just a few months ago, we at Human Rights Watch published a blockbuster investigation on how these education technologies, otherwise known as ed tech, endorsed by 49 governments for kids to use during the pandemic. And because we looked at 49 of the world's most populous countries, our research ended up covering the majority of kids in the world who had some access to internet and a device. And the other thing that I'll quickly note is that I began this research deliberately a year after the pandemic first started, so in March 2021. And the reason for this was that you know, we weren't looking to penalize governments who are trying to make the best of decisions in the worst circumstances. Open the code of a companies around the globe. And I was really trying to answer three questions. The first, to figure out what kind of data these products were collecting about kids. The second, how they were collecting it. And then the third, to see who they were sending kids data to. 
So what I uncovered really was shocking, even to me. In the rush to connect kids to online classrooms, every government except for one authorized the use of at least one online learning product that surveilled children online, outside of school hours, and deep into their private lives. For the first time, we now have evidence, technical evidence, that the majority of these online learning products used around the world uh, harvested data on who children are, where they are, what they're doing both inside and outside of their online classrooms, who their family and friends are, and what kinds of devices that their families could afford for them to use. Some of these products actually digitally fingerprinted children in ways that were impossible to avoid or get rid of without throwing the child's device away in the trash. And this last point really bears repeating. The fact that these online learning websites and apps, again, for designed for kids and for online learning, were using such sophisticated tracking techniques to the point that even if you were the world's foremost information security expert and you wanted to protect your child, there was really no way to protect yourself or your child from this kind of surveillance. That's how disproportionate and insidious this was. So then to get to the third question of who they were sending kids data to, most of these products sent kids personal sensitive information to advertising tech companies. These companies analyze this kind of data to guess at who a child might be, to predict what they might do next, and crucially, how they might be influenced. And so by using children's data extracted from them in educational settings, to then target them with personalized content and ads that, that track and follow them across the internet, these companies not only distorted kids' online experiences, but they also risked influencing their opinions and beliefs at a time where they might be highly influenced. So let me give you an example, a concrete example of what all of this means. In the course of my research, I had the amazing opportunity to work with Rodan. He is the bubbliest nine-year-old you'll ever meet. And he lives in Istanbul, in Turkey, with his family. And with his consent and with his mom's consent, I got to follow him during a regular school day online. And I watched him as he logged into class at the beginning of his day and he waved hi to his teacher and his friends. And I saw him fall asleep while watching a math video and try to upload his history homework on a social media platform and just go throughout his day. At the same time, I saw what was happening behind the scenes. Within milliseconds of Rodan logging into his platform to say hi to his teacher, swarms of trackers immediately hooked onto him and began recording every single tiny bit of behavior that he was doing. Um, the platform that he used to upload his homework um, started collecting his geolocation data. And to put that into simple terms, this app was collecting Rodan's precise coordinates. And taken over time, if you'll remember, all of us were under lockdown in our various countries at home. And kids especially were not traveling outside of their home. So this app over time could not only figure out where Rodan lived, but actually where he spent most of his time during the day, which in his case was his family's living room. That's how sensitive and precise the kind of data that these online learning products were collecting about this child. So <laughs> now that I, I've scared everyone uh, about some of, some of the findings of this work, what was particular about this piece of research was that it showed for the first time that children were really forced to pay with, for their education with their privacy. And children and parents were largely kept in the dark. 
you know, everyone operated in a kind of blind faith that governments were choosing products that were safe for kids to use. But it actually turns out that governments themselves violated kids' rights. 39 governments made built products and websites and apps themselves that violated kids' rights in some way. And not only that, some governments made it compulsory for students and teachers to use their product which then made it possible, impossible for kids to protect themselves by opting for an alternative, even if they knew what was going on. And I think that's also the critical point here is that these products did not allow students to decline to be tracked. Most of this monitoring happened secretly without the child or the family knowing or consenting. And to make matters even worse, all of this took place in educational settings where kids and parents couldn't give meaningful consent because in order for you to attend school or to be marked as attending school that day, you had to use the EdTech product or website or app that the school told you to use. And it was impossible for kids to opt out of surveillance without opting out of school and giving up on learning altogether during the pandemic. But there is a way out of all of this. Um, it is indeed possible to deliver online learning to kids without compelling them to give up their privacy. And I'm, I think we'll hear a little bit about that from the other panelists in the session. And I will just say, conclude by saying that as a result of this work, we are calling on all countries and governments to pass child data protection laws because it's not the responsibility of a child or a parent or a teacher to know how to protect themselves. It's the responsibility of governments to keep both governments and companies accountable to how they handle kids' privacy and ultimately to be able to protect them online. Um, thank you once again for joining us and for giving us insight on it. It really goes to show that this is a global issue that we all need to address, and I think there's no better place for us to address it than the IGF. So thank you very much again. I will immediately give the floor to our next speaker, who is joining us online as well. He is Professor Rodolfo Avelino from INSPER. Um, so, Rodolfo, I hope you can hear us. Um, if everything is fine, the floor is yours. And if you can give us a little insight, considering your technical background on how those um, business models operate and on how those tracking mechanisms work um, on EdTech apps, that would be really amazing. So thank you for joining us. I know it's still very early in Brazil. So <laughs> um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. And um, I shared my screen. One minute, please. I'm sorry, <laughs> I have a problem for sharing my screen. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I need to restart my, my equation, Zoom. We, we we are seeing your screen. Yeah. We can see. Ah, yeah. yeah, 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 we can see it. Take care, take care. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. You see my yes. presentation. presentation? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, it is. 
I'm sorry. No problem. And, and first of all, I would like to apologize for any further mistake about my English. I have been studying to improve, improve it. And appreciate the invitation to participate in this event. Um, I am Rodolfo Avelino, professor and specialist in cybersecurity. Oh, thanks. No, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, and I carry out research related to privacy and uh, surveillance. Um, I have been researching web behavior tracking technologies and the increasing reliance on personal data for the past few years to sustain a data-driven economy. In the sense, seeking to understand this complex phenomenon, I have been developing a theory that evolves from a first look at the concept of data colonialism by Caudry and Mejias and the advances to a broader theory of digital colonialism very much in line with Michael Quet. My definition of uh, digital colonialism is and digital colonialism can be analyzed from um, the technological imprisonment in the digital ecosystem of electronic devices, network protocols, infrastructure of the cloud computing, and the programming language. This ecosystem is the part, the path that uh, allows internet to communicate, transfer, and process personal data, systems, and services. Um, it is intrinsically connected with the big tech's monopoly, which influences the technological and services standards about the new peoples. Oh, new people, sorry. It is still possible to evaluate this process through notions of imperialism and the rapid growth of asymmetrical power relations, especially in the United States and China. It was intensified in the 90s, uh, mainly with the popularization of the personal computers, the internet and cell phones. During this period, the nucleus responsible for expanding digital colonialism around the world, Silicon Valley also emerged. Headquarters of the main companies that have custody of the largest personal databases in the world, Silicon Valley. Located in California, was made possible thanks to the intense public funding of research and infrastructure from the US government. The traces pro produced by cyber mediated transactions sustained most of the big tax revenues. In the business model, the information collected about our behaviors is the fundamental how materials of uh, materials for algorithm to predict what it will will do in a series of situations. And for this economy keep it growing, corporations need to expand and uh, the extractions of their whole materials, that is data collections. For this, 
large companies such as Google, Amazon, and Facebook have created a strategy to expand the offer of uh, new services, most uh, of which are free and the users do not need to pay, do not need to pay cash to use them. However, they need to allow companies collect and use your data. It is in this context that Google, for example, started to develop productions and services for the most diverse purpose. Nowadays, we have browser, search engine, email, cloud storage, GPS, online translator, video platforms, and the stream of music, among others. They more servers, they more services and the productions available, and the more Google is able to collect it, variated data to later use in this business strategies, increasing its power over uh, comparatives and the profit profitability. The mailing ambitions for personal data by the big techs indicates that it is in the main field for the expansion, expansion of their business based on growth and expansion based on the capitalist centricity in data. Uh, the, they do not restrict, restrict themselves to their core business and uh, incited seek uh, to increasingly expand the, expand the extractions of data from different sources. Alphabet, for example, was original, originally founded uh, as a search engine company in 1998 under the name Google and uh, has historically looked at, of, uh, looked at for opportunities for new acquis uh, acquired to expand its data collections compatibilities. In 2015, the company created a holding company called Alphabet. And since then, in, in addition to controlling Google, it has been diversi uh, diversifying its business far beyond search engines. Alphabet has become one of the largest technology conglomerates in the world. The table below presents some acquisitions carried out by Alphabet in the last decades. It is possible to observe that it is expanding its business, diversity from different types of data to get, for example. Uh, Sorry, no problem. No problem. Um, for example, company Nest and uh, type of business, smart home productions. Google acquired the Nest in 2014. Other example, company Double Click, ad serving and the management solutions. And Google acquired the Double click in 28. Looker, business intelligence and the data analysis softwares. 20, 2019. Other company, Waze, mobile navigations. And uh, Fitbit, fitness devices and app. Google acquired Fitbit in 
2021. Um, in this table that I developed, I tried to compare the characteristics of the layers of the TCP IP model, the layers and the layers of internet governance, the main models of cloud computing, and finally, where each of the main platforms are working. It's possible to observe that Amazon and Google are present in all layers of the internet. To conclude the processing of the student data flows follows the same logic of having other types of data that can enrich the larger data database of these corporations. This slide presents a survey carried out, out in South America by the University of Paraná, Para, sorry, which analyzed which universities have the email services of big techs. More than 78% of universities in South America host their emails on big tech services. Finally, most of them are hosted on Google services. And uh, within my thesis is where digital colonialism has been, has been concentrated um, in this company. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rodolfo, for bringing this perspective of digital colonialism to our discussion. Um, it's really important that we understand the power dynamics between the North and the Global South to really get a full grasp of the debate. Um, so I thank you again. And we're going straight ahead to our next speaker who's joining us on site. It's Marina Meira from Data Privacy Brazil Research Association. Marina, thank you so much for joining us and for co-hosting and co-organizing this panel with us. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Thank you. Is it? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you, João. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, good morning, good night. Well, I think from Brazil, it's good night. So uh, hello, everyone. So as João said, I'm Marina Meira. I'm the head of projects of Data Privacy Brazil Research Association. We are a nonprofit civil society organization based in Brazil, as the name says, um, that promotes the protection of personal data and other fundamental rights in the face of the emergence of new technologies, social inequalities, and power asymmetries. I'm a lawyer by training. Um, and I'm also the coordinator of the working group on data and childhood of the Commission for the Defense of Children's Rights from the Sao Paulo Division of the Brazilian Bar Association. So I've been working with this topic of the defense of children's digital rights, including those before the ed tech industry, um, for quite a while. And my work has been focused in, has been based within two premises in these last years. So the first one is the need to centralize all actions around the concept of the best interests of the child. And I'll get more to that, into that soon. And the second one, the second premise, uh, arises from the fact that children cannot be treated as a monolithic group. So in my case, that means going deep into the particularities of the Latin American context and on how that affects the relationship between children and technologies in general and uh, children in the tech, ed tech industry in particular. And when I talk about this context, um, I want to highlight how Latin America, also as part of the Global South, is marked by profound inequalities. Um, the access to the internet and to technologies is still far from being universal. Um, there's a large number of mothers, fathers, and families who did not have access to digital literacy 
or who have several jobs in order to sustain their homes and therefore cannot support their children while they use devices and digital platforms, educational or not. In the case of Brazil, also more specifically, um, it is also a context in which zero rating policies are in place in the favor of big techs, what turns WhatsApp and Facebook, for example, to largely widespread means of communication also among children from a very early age. Unfortunately, also my home country's federal government conducted murderous policies during the pandemic, which actively left thousands of children orphaned, increased the child learning deficit and impover impoverishment of the entire population. Um, at the same time, in this emergency pandemic scenario, we saw big techs reaching out to education ministries and secretariats in Brazil, not only, but um, to offer them their products for free. But we all, as we've been talking today, and as Han and Rodolfo presented, we know that this for free actually serves their interests, and I mean the industry interests in many matters. So keeping all that in mind, I want to start addressing, um, as, as the lawyer of the panel, one of the lawyers, um, the question of why exploiting um, children's data and students' data um, commercially is a problem. And it is problematic, um, especially in the, it is problematic as a whole, but especially in the educational context. And to start this conversation, I think we can all agree, I hope we can all agree, that we want all children to fully access education, and we want this education to be actually emancipating to them. So first, the, this commercial exploitation has a purpose issue. The reason why we use technologies in school is supposed to be, in my view, um, to support the development of an emancipating education for all students. And this goal is in no way related to mass surveillance or to the use of student data to targeted advertising. On the contrary, there is a clear purpose deviation. So these opaque and after all profitable intended data handling practices are a sign that children's rights to education is being captured by harmful technologies as they are reinforcing their insertion into the attention and data economy in general. This pairing uh, of the ad tech industry with the attention economy and targeted advertising industry, as it's clear from Hans' um, research, um, has been promoting a clear violation of the students' rights to privacy and to the protection of personal data as well. And on top of that, um, as also Rodolfo started mentioning, it promotes children's behavioral manipulation. And to an extent that we're still unaware of, neither in terms of present uh, nor future, and neither in terms of individual nor collective impacts. And, and how is that so? So children are beings who are going under a developmental stage. Um, they need to be able to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes, and also to experiment um, throughout this development in order to understand and mold their own personalities. I mean, who hasn't had a face when you were younger and that you now look at and you're like, oh my God, what, what was I doing? Um, so the logic behind the database business model and the attention economy in general, um, uh, well, also totally linked to the surveillance and commercial use of data, um, is mostly based on profiling techniques that will aggregate people um, with similar interests into groups and will then constantly target these people the type of content that, ch that is understood to be interesting for them. And then the content here, I mean ads, which are really problematic when we think of children being targeted with ads as children are vulnerable um, to, to, well, to ads in general, but also I mean uh, content in general, as Rodolfo also um, mentioned. I mean, after all, the idea of the database business models is, uh, that is adopted by most digital platform and unfortunately is being fed by the ad tech industry is to sell advertising, but also to make um, the, the platforms display so apparently interesting uh, and therefore keep all people online for as long as possible so that more data is learned about them, is collected, and the targeted content can get even more precise. 
And when it comes to children in particular, this purpose of keeping them online and onto their devices for as long as possible so that the attention economy cycle can keep on turning relates to a problem of addiction to screens. I mean, as children are, are beings who are going under developmental stages, learning to deal with their desires and instincts, they might have a tougher time, and I mean, I'm saying tougher because us adults already have a tough time sometimes, resisting dark patterns and addictive platform traits, and that can impact directly on children's mental health. I mean, we do know that the content of most digital platforms is not appropriate to children, and also impact on children's physical health, like they, it can be related to eyesight problems or to a more sedentary lifestyle, for example. And the problem is still much broader than this. Uh, the, the need for children to experiment on their personalities is completely undermined by the attention economy and its profiling and aggregation data techniques. In the end, what we see today is that the content that reaches children online and therefore will influence their personality shaping is to some extent being dictated by private and commercial interests. So besides behavioral manipulation, this aggregation and specific content target, targeting can also reinforce discrimination. Uh, I mean, for example, we know that the advertising industry is still sexist and reproduces gender stereotypes. Usually, I don't know, we see a lot in Brazil, for example, uh, ads targeted to children, uh, but then when it's to boys, it's cars and adventurous um, uh, toys. And when it's to girls, we see, for example, little kitchens and stoves. So that is also uh, an issue related to all this industry. And well, the problem is, I mean, there are a lot of problems with that, but the problem is uh, we're letting the ad tech industry be a part of this. And if that's not scary and the absolute contrary of what an emancipating um, education means, then I don't know what is. And uh, as, as Han did, I don't want to wrap up in a pessimistic way, so I want to start raising some possible paths on how to move forward and tackle this craziness, especially from a regulatory point of view. So first of all, I understand that in order to face this problematic current scenario of, of the ad tech industry, we need to understand that the protection of children's rights will only be actually reached once it's shared among all of society. So much is often said about families being responsible for educating children to use digital devices and services, but we have to remember those inequalities I mentioned at first. So families who don't have access to the internet, families who haven't had digital literacy training, or families who were devastated in the pandemic. Families, of course, they should support children in the use of ad tech apps as much as possible, but that cannot be all. We cannot stop the talk there. Also because depriving children from education is not an option, as Han also mentioned. So we need to think about how states choose ad tech app tools to be adopted in public education and how schools themselves choose tools to be adopted in the private sector, education especially. And we need to address the responsibility of the private sector as a whole. And then I mean the ad tech companies themselves, but also the companies uh, from other sectors which are buying students' data from them and profiting uh, on students' data in general. Uh, that said, when addressing the responsibility of states, schools, and the private sector, we need to bring the concept of the best interest of the child to the table. And that's not me, Marina, saying. It's the UN's Convention of the Rights of the Child, which is the most ratified international treaty in the whole world. Um, it says clearly that all actions that directly or potentially affect children must be undertaken in order to fulfill their best interests. And, and what does that mean in practical terms? So the UN's Committee on the Rights of the Child tells us that in its general comment 14, which explains that the best interests of the child is a threefold concept. First of all, it's a substantive right. So children have the right to have their best interests fulfilled and prevail over other interests, any other interests. And if the ad tech industry is favoring its profits over children's rights to an emancipating education, children's rights to informational self-determination and to a free development, children's best interest is not being fulfilled. Second, the concept is a principle to be evoked whenever a legal provision is open to more than one interpretation. 
and necessarily the one that most effectively serves the child's best interests should be chosen. And last but not least, children's best interests also unfolds as a rule of procedure. Whenever a decision is to be made that will affect children, the decision-making process must include an evaluation of the possible impact of that decision on the children concerned. When it comes to the ad tech industry, that can be translated into the obligation for states, schools, and definitely the ad tech industry itself to conduct impact assessments before developing or deploying technologies that will handle students' data. That in order to assure that risks to children's rights, well, students as a whole, but we're focusing on children, will be mitigated and their best interests will be fulfilled. And that can only be assured if the impact assessment is conducted through a strict methodology with the participation of all those involved, including children themselves. And if someone wants to go deeper into this conversation, please come find me because we're developing uh, a study on that at Data Privacy Brazil. Um, so to wrap it up, this best interest framework is international and we should all seek for instruments that assure it. But that's not all. We also need to address the need for local regulation to be put in place for the ad tech industry, which is mostly unregulated in a specific way throughout the world. And we need regulations that impose concrete rules to assure student protection, accountability to the industry, children's best interests, of course, and we need regulation that directly dialogues with local peculiarities. So that's it as the first round, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Marina, for explaining so beautifully how these business models collide with best interest. Um, like you said, the best interest of the child is one of the main considerations, one of the main guiding principles of the UN's Convention on Children's Rights. So it is absolutely imperative that we take it as a serious consideration, a primary consideration, rather than an empty abstract concept, which is what we see in practice a lot of the times when we're talking about regulation. So thank you once again. Um, certain, um, last, but certainly not least, we have Nidhi Ramash joining us online. Um, Nidhi is a youth ambassador at Five Rights. Um, she is also um, um, the creator of the Right Angle podcast, which I strongly recommend everyone checking out. And she's here rep representing children and teenagers on our panel. So Nidhi, I would like to reinforce once again how important it is to have you with us. Um, there is no way that we can conduct this discussion without listening to the people that are the most affected by those issues. So thank you so, 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 so much for joining us once again. And I would love to hear um, your perspective on the commercial exploitation of children's data and your opinions on how governments can take children's views into account when regulating those platforms and those um, business models. So thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I just want to reintroduce myself. Hi, I'm Nidhi Ramesh, and I'm a 14-year-old student. Although I'm from India, I currently live and study in Malaysia and attend a school here. And in fact, I've just come home from school and it's around half past four in the afternoon. So again, it's a great honor to be representing the youth on this forum. And thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, this is such an important topic, especially from a teenager's perspective. As we've heard from all the others, it's obvious that young people extensively use technology in our day-to-day -day lives. Nowadays, uh, online platforms and digital tools are available for anything and everything, whether it's for our education, music, videos, socializing, playing games, or with anything that we can think of. We are a generation who is growing up in this digitally interconnected world, and we are increasingly becoming ever so dependent on it. That is why safety and privacy online is so important. I am particularly delighted that forums like these allow us children to participate and listen to what we have to say on topics that impact us the most. So thank you, Alana Institute, uh, for having me here. Earlier in the year, I had the privilege of being a youth ambassador on an online panel hosted by Five Rights Foundation London, where I was part of an event discussing and launching a children's online safety toolkit for governments and institutions. The opportunity to share ideas on how we could make online safe for kids with leaders from the African Union and European Union was indeed eye-opening. It was also a privilege to be on the same stage with Prince Harry, 
and to listen to his views on how everyone could play a role in keeping children safe online. This IGF forum and this topic in particular on children's data privacy while using educational apps is quite aligned to the overall safety of children online that I was engaged with. Um, now, before I begin, I just want to say that I'm definitely not a professional and what I say is based on my opinion and what I think. So, of course, as someone who has just turned 14 last month, I should admit that my friends and I use digital platforms extensively. Everywhere I go, I see children on mobiles, iPads, and devices. The pandemic, I believe, has ex especially accelerated this, and online access has become not just common, but an essential part of whatever we do daily, inside and outside of the classroom. For example, I use an online platform called Anchor to host my podcast, The Right Angle. The beauty of this online tool is that it reaches listeners in over 40 countries instantly. It's so easy to use, and I've been using it for three years now. I also write and have authored two books here again when I wanted to publish them. The first thing that came to my mind was publishing these online. Getting it out on an online platform, like a digital ebook on Amazon Kindle, was the easiest, fastest, and cheapest option I could think of. Through this, my books are now available on every corner of the world for people to read. I also have my own website that I use to publish my work online. We, as this generation, also use social media, educational websites, language apps on our mobile phones, etc. We also use digital platforms like Google Classroom to access school lessons, attend classes, share notes, do homework, etc. Using online tools is a key part of who we are and how we go about our day-to-day -day lives. And this, I'm sure, is the case with most kids around the world. Of course, all of this sounds great and very useful, but what we have increasingly realized is that these very companies who provide such wonderful solutions are providing these purely for their own commercial gains. Just imagine all the tools I talked about, Anchor, Kindle, Wix, Google, social media sites, Almost all are seemingly free to use and also require very little parental permissions online. So there should be a trade-off in terms of what they are getting from us children while providing us with these services for free. It is all our data that is being recorded and used for further commercial gains, to the extent of which they are going that has no limits and sometimes can be extremely dangerous, especially when it comes to data that is private and personal. So these so-called online tools and educational apps can capture children's locations, their personal details, their usage patterns, their other interests, their preferences, eating habits, contacts, and even data on their devices that may, that may be totally unrelated to what the tool is even being used for. Anything we click is being recorded. Our pictures, our conversations, our texts, everything. The question really is how are these organizations utilizing our digital footprint and the data captured while we use their apps and platforms. Technology companies do argue that they have sought the permissions through their elaborate terms and conditions, but practically who reads that 10 page long list of TNCs? And most children aren't aware of what the implications are on what they read and accept in the terms and conditions. I can't remember the last time when I fully read and understood any TNC and the consequence of that. Even we see adults not reading these, leave alone children. In a way, forcing users to accept the TNCs is the best excuse for companies to capture all what they want. There are instances where data is leaked or even sold to third party companies to sell related products, send spam emails, or further use this data for totally unrelated purposes than what was in initially intended when users subscribed for those apps. The data could haunt the children after many years. They could also get into the wrong hands for online abusers to reach children and hurt them. They may be used to hack and defraud accounts that are linked, etc. Trolling, shaming, and abusing are some of the examples we've seen off late. I am sure we are talking about this important topic because the answer to providing safety is not easy and straightforward. The ownership of companies and the internet goes beyond national boundaries. And not all platforms can be brought into the same rule of law and make them accountable. This makes it even more complicated. Of 
course, the first and foremost way to protect children online is to be aware of what data they provide and whether these apps that they use are putting their data in unwanted hands. Check the company's reputation, reviews, take advice from parents and teachers, and check online if you're in doubt before using them. Maybe teachers should be trained in schools to help students understand how to keep their data safe. The other way is to ensure that we have the best practices enforced that puts all technology companies that offer solutions to children only take data that is relevant. This has to be mandated or companies should face severe consequences. This is where the IGF can play a role and convince governments to enforce these universally. Governments should come together and make laws that ensure that children stay safe online and that their data is protected. As a summary, I would like to say that it's obvious that technology is not going away. And children are increasingly going to use the internet and online apps for their educational needs and other social media requirements. We have to protect our privacy or else this will go unchecked and spiral out of hands. The internet is spreading too fast and the people abusing the data are trying to go faster. Whatever is their motive, money or any other, we should work collectively to bring laws across national boundaries, encouraging organizations, government agencies and international institutions like the United Nations to mandate rules that will help protect us online and our privacy. Thank you very much. Urgent in the new technologies and thinks critically about it. Um, so thank you again for this uh, class, for teaching us uh, that much. So unfortunately, our other panelist, Michael Canuel from LEARN, a nonprofit organization which provides resources and services to the educational community of Canada, had a technical problem with his, with his internet and is not able to be here today. The idea was to listen to him uh, about other inspiring possibilities to be used as alternatives um, uh, to the uh, tech industry. Hope we have other opportunities. I know you have. <coughs> now we have half an hour, I think. No, less than this. Yeah, half an hour? 40 minutes? <laughs> okay, we have some time <laughs> to, <laughs> to ask questions and bring thoughts online and on site. Uh, who wants to start? I'm going to start here on, on site. Anyone here? Wants? Okay, here and here. Please. Okay. Can you? Uh, I don't know how. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, I'm Rodrigo Lopes. I'm a researcher from Brazil and I'm also a participant in Brazil's Internet Committee Youth Program. And my question is to um, Hai Jung Han, and sorry if I mispronounced your name, but um, one of the points made in your speech um, that has intrigued me the most was um, about how um, all the data collection um, serves to the final purpose of um, backing up the direction of personalized um, advertising the children. So um, could you briefly um, speak on how this data is used to deliver this um, personalized content? I would like to hear more about like in what ways um, companies use um, that data to um, like reach to children in a, a more precise way. Thank you. Okay, if the panelists are... Uh, Agree. We've gained together three three questions, and then we return to the panelists. Is it okay? Okay. Okay. Shall I proceed? Uh, thank you for the chance. <coughs> uh, firstly, thank you for uh, this briefing presentation, and it's very interesting for uh, IGF because uh, uh, scenario about children and kids is very interesting for the next global citizen. So it's a very interesting issue. Uh, the first question and suggestion for, I think, Medina. Yeah. Uh, you try to present about 
uh, rule and regulation, uh, especially by GOV's governments and uh, private companies and schools, especially policy and regulation issue. It's important, actually. But my doubt is the big take uh, is at this time is very giant and influencing uh, global governments. So uh, how can we, uh, uh, working with such giant technology, because they are influencing much uh, the global citizen and the global government and political structure. So how can uh, we try to cooperate with such giant technology mm. honors. The, the problem is uh, because the algorithm by itself is a problem. They know the algorithm, they know how it works. So the manipulation is obvious. So how can, how can we manage? Actually, the globe, uh, this giant technology are the customers or the communities are even the global citizen, the contrary, the contradiction is this. So how to complement the reality and uh, the next generation? How, how, can, how, how can we handle it? Uh, as a psychologist, I, I, I try to observe such influences like when uh, kids and younger generation or the adolescents use social media, there are different like communication problems, like instant gratification. It's by, by its nature, adolescents are instantly grat gratified by such pity, pity things, small things. And even they are, the problem is that social anxiety, so we use social media platforms especially, and the problem of conflict resolution, and even uh, emotional problems, like uh, emotional intelligence problems affected by uh, such platforms because the algorithm by itself is addictive power. It has addictive uh, indicator or addictive, uh, uh, it promotes to use tremendously. So how can we govern this kind of contradictions? If you have any idea or any suggestion. And actually the giant uh, technology must work with uh, such emerging citizen because kids are very important. They are the actually their customer will be, the next customer will be these kids. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Next, there. Okay, may we stop with the lady there? Then we we open again if it's necessary. Okay. Um. Thank you. My name is Temba. I'm from the Information Regulator in South Africa. So, my question is, um, um, the, the the one of the speakers mentioned that. Um, it's important to also have um, privacy laws um, directly for, for children. Now my question is, um, is this an idea where the privacy laws for children are independent of the existing uh, privacy regulations, where they would be a standalone, or there would be an, addi an, an addition to the existing, you know, privacy laws because um, an example in South Africa is where our privacy regulation does um, put um, regulations for children's uh, processing of the information of children. So uh, I just need to understand if this would be an addition or um, this, is it sufficient to have it included in the main privacy regulations. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to appreciate uh, all the presenters in this session. My name is uh, Caroline Murianki uh, from the Communications Authority of Kenya. As part of our Child Online Protection uh, and Safety Program, uh, we really try to drive uh, availability of productive uh, uh, solutions for young people so that we could get a lot of uh, content and information that uh, young people can access and use in Kenya. However, um, the, the use of um, technology in terms of, of for, for education and learning uh, has become a challenge in that uh, there may be need for us to understand what, how to balance 
um, uh, access and privacy issues vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, protection issues. Uh, let me just give a scenario. There are some solution providers that have approached us with the hope that we could endorse some of the uh, solutions, but it becomes a challenge because at what point do you say that uh, this content should not be accessed by a child and what should they access? Are there thresholds that have been put in place? Are there any um, matrices that uh, one could, a country could adopt so that we could look at uh, whether and see whether this edtech solution is good or this solution is good for use by children within the learning environment or the home environment that uh, a regulator or a government could recommend? That, that is a question that uh, would be of interest uh, to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We're going to stop here and then we open again, okay? So, Han, would you like to start, to start answering? Sure. Okay. Um, wow, thank you all for all of these wonderful questions. I'm actually going to take them in from most recent to least recent, because <laughs> that's how my brain works. And I'm actually, I'll start with both Caroline and Temba's uh, questions. And I'm really excited to have you both in the room because this research actually looked at, of all the 49 countries and included South Africa and Kenya. And in both cases, uh, both governments built their education ministries, built their own websites, which I found were violating kids' rights in some way or another. So I'd love to have follow-up conversations with you on how to better protect kids in your respective countries. Um, Caroline, to answer your question, it's I think the question of appropriate content is absolutely country-specific. And it's, of course, um, a lot of that work falls on your agency or other government agencies in Kenya to determine what is appropriate content for kids. That being said, when it comes to essentially evaluating whether a website or an app protects kids' privacy, there's absolutely universal technical standards and matrices. Um, and to be honest, a lot of these standards that uh, I recommended in my report and also researched and talked with companies and governments about is these don't require a lot of money. Actually, a lot of them don't require money at all. Sometimes it's just a matter of uh, asking a company to change a line of code to make sure that they don't track kids location data in a certain way or they don't share that data with third party advertisers. There's actually there's actually very um, easy specific things that a regulator could require companies to do and to be able to easily check and for that you know i'm happy to make myself available for for more detailed conversations um temba on your question about standalone child data protection laws i think marina and maria and others will also have opinions on this but my first sense is that it is absolutely up to you there's two different ways to do it Right, which is you can either have a standalone data protection law in addition to whatever existing data protection laws you have for the general public, or you can also put together um, legal guidelines specific to kids that are enforceable by, by your regulatory agency. But in any case, I think the, the key takeaway is that there needs to be child specific either law or guidelines that are enforceable because kids do require specific protections even more so than adults do. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that offline. And to the first um, question from Rodrigo, and I hope I remember your name correctly, about uh, behavioral advertising. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Um, I think I'll ask everyone in the room to remember this scary term, Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> As you'll remember, this was the huge scandal that fa then Facebook, now Meta, found itself where it was discovered that the company was creating shadow profiles on people who had never signed up for a Facebook account, sharing that data with this firm called Cambridge Analytica. And the idea there was 
um, all this information that Facebook had collected about you was being used to make a shadow profile that would determine or guess at what kind of a person you were, again, how you might easily be influenced, et cetera, et cetera. The reason I bring that case up from 2016 is that, that there was a specific uh, type of tracking tool that Facebook had built to enable that. It's called the Facebook Pixel and now they've renamed it the MetaPixel. And this particular type of tracking allows any website, when they send their users data to Facebook using this tool, it allows two things. The first is it allows that original website to target that person across the internet and to any Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp accounts that they have, and to be able to advertise to them there. And of course, the second is that it allows Facebook to use that data in whatever advertising purpose it chooses to, including to resell it to other advertisers. I found that a significant number of edtech products were using this tool and I have uh, and I was able to document in real time transmissions of children's data being sent to Facebook using this tool. Uh, and so that tool also that's kind of, I, I gave you a very long winded explanation, but essentially that tool enables behavioral advertising by Facebook and any of Facebook's any of ad, any advertiser that advertises on Facebook. So that's the first thing. Um, the second is Google, which is also a, a very well known giant company as um, Pro Professor Avellino mentioned in his uh, session uh, talk and you know. I knew going into this piece of research that everyone uses Google's to any internet developer uses Google's to tools in some way or another, even if it's for a benign purpose like using Google Analytics to measure uh, web analytics on, on your website. The problem here is twofold. The first was 98% of the products I used uh, sent data to Google just generally, but of that number, a significant portion sent information to Google's advertising specific domains that are tailored for behavioral advertising. Again, like in the Facebook example, it allowed these edtech products to track their users after they left their platforms to be able to advertise them to them elsewhere on the internet. It also allowed According to the terms of service, it also allows Google to use those kids' data for whatever advertising purpose they would like for perpetuity, um, specifically for behavioral advertising. And, it, and, and just to wrap that up, um, an, an, example I'm thinking, an example I'm thinking about is from Kazakhstan. There was a startup in Kazakhstan that you know, had no one had ever heard about it before the pandemic and the pandemic hit, the government recommended it and suddenly this tiny startup which had 10 users suddenly ballooned into half of Kazakhstan's child population overnight. Um, and we know this because the CEO founder went on an interview with Forbes Kazakhstan and, you know, talked very proudly about this thing. Interestingly, with this newfound success, this startup founder said, hmm, well, I suddenly have this captive audience of half of our country's children. What can I do with this? And I documented, I noticed and documented that on the website where kids are logging in, he put a price list for advertisers. And in there, he wrote, <laughs> um, this, this product had both a website and an app version, and he said, you know, if advertisers, if you'd like to advertise to kids uh, for one day, it will cost you this amount. If you would like us to forcefully send push notifications to our app so that kids, you know, the, the, the ad pops up on the kid's phone before the kid even has a chance to decline or to deny consent, um, it will cost you this much more over this many days. And this kind of, and it was extremely blatant. And to top it all off, the CEO uh, included a client list of previous advertisers who had purchased these services to be able to advertise on his online learning platform. 
and they mostly included fast food companies and conglomerates that sell like Nestle and McDonald's, etc. So just to give you a sense of how and, and then to tie back to Marina's point about the fact that the decisions being made at this kind of level are not in the child's best interest at all. And with that, I'll stop and pass it over to other folks. Oh, wow. Thank you, Han. Again, I've just remembered that this important, scary and challenging report Han presented us is available in several languages on Human Rights Watch site, right, Han? So everyone is invited to, to know it better. So I'll pass away to Marina, please, to your consideration. Um, thank you. So try to address some of the questions, including the, the, the million dollar question, which is how do we fight <laughs> these huge international big techs? Um, well, I wish I knew the answer. I don't think it's um, simple, but I think this is a great place for us to start strategizing and thinking together of how to to approach that. And um, I mean, as, as uh, people working at organizations from civil society, sometimes we feel small because it's just some of us and they got like tons of money and the best lawyers in the world. So it is definitely a, a, a big challenge. So some of my insights here. So definitely, I mean, the, 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 the big tax business models is completely problematic in general but it is especially problematic when it comes to children. So I think that um, using um, childhood and the concept of children's best interests could be um, a starting point for us to do um, advocacy against this business model as a whole, because it can be easier to convince um, regulators and well, the ju justice systems, international and local, in the first place that it is problematic to children. And once we do that, I think we can continue going on. So I think that's the first thing. Um, my second point is I think we should do um, more um, international level advocacy. So there is this document which is really important for our discussion. It's um, the UN's Committee for the Rights of the Child General Comment 25. It's the, a general comment on children's rights in relation to the digital environment. And they do mention education and privacy and how, well, and ev every time children are in the digital environment, their best interests should be fulfilled. So that's a first step, but it's still um, not a very concrete document. So I think we can... Um, perhaps work on um, international cases that are built on top of that, um, taking concrete cases to an international scale. But what I think would also be really um, strategic is to choose some key countries and places where we can litigate, for example, um, so that we get rulings that say that this commercial use of children's data and perhaps educate ed tech apps are also a good strategic gateway of starting the discussion um, of why it's problematic. I think once we get uh, one good ruling, um, we can go after, we can replicate that in other countries and not only because of the uh, that other ruling, but also because then we can uh, evoke the principle of non-discrimination that is really big in the, well, children's um, uh, rights uh, declaration of the UN and in several countries' legislations, I guess most of countries' legislations. Um, that has happened before. For example, in the US, there was a case a few years ago, it was New Mexico versus Google. So they tried to sue Google saying they, they were using commercially children's data. It did not work, but it did not work uh, because the case was not, was dismissed for formal reasons. So. It is problematic. I recommend everyone studying that case and perhaps we can also learn from it. And last but not least, uh, the, the, the question that was made about specific children's um, regulation, like children data protection. Um, 
I think, and that's my personal opinion, I think that all data protection regulations, general regulations, they have to address children in specific, because children are beings going under de a developmental phase. But I think that those general regulations, they will not be able to um, be complete to actually protect children. So me personally, I think that um, besides having a special section in general protection regulations, data protection regulations, uh, especially DPAs should look into children's uh, data protection in a specific way. So we have been seeing that, for example, um, most, well, it's mostly in the global north uh, up until now. Hopefully it will widespread. But we have seen DPAs, for example, from um, the UK, from France, from the Netherlands. They're starting to issue their, their own regulations on children data protection. And they, I think that's interesting because they go over it in a really broad way. So you can issue specific design measures, measures that are not only um, uh, not, not only uh, relate to rights and uh, obligations, so you can issue specific design measures and also other measures such as the, the, the obligation of conducting data protection impact assessments when it comes to children in specific. And I think also if you issue that regulation um, within the, the DPA, it can be a, a bit less, a bit less, and that's not in every country of course, but it can be a little less uh, a bit less subject to political interest in general. So I think it can be led perhaps with a more broad view and with the participation of specialists of several um, fields. So not only the, the law specialists and regulators, but also people from the educational system, from pediatrics and all sorts of, well, areas of knowledge that involve children and also children themselves. So we have Nidhi here too. <laughs> Perhaps she can even say more about that. But we have seen other um, some DPAs involving children um, in the discussions to create those regulations, and I think that's very um, valid as well. So I hope I was able to kind of address the, the questions. Surely, don't you think? So I'm afraid we have to finish now. But um, I think that if we don't uh, answer the those one million questions, it's on not only one, I think we have more kind of clues to ensure safe and privacy respecting education technologies, isn't it? So I want to reinforce that we must face children's rights, uh, digital rights as a priority, especially in the, glo the global south. Um, and I'd also like to finish paying tribute to someone who teaches us in Brazil a lot about these issues, these issues we are discussing here today, which is Professor Danilo Doneda. He's in a very difficult health situation, and we would like him to hear uh, again, once more, how grateful uh, we are to have him along, uh, along with us, building ways uh, for children to be treated as an absolute priority also in the internet or on the internet. So I'm so thankful uh, for this session and I hope you have enjoyed it uh, just as much as did. Thank you everyone who joins, uh, joined us and you keep in touch. <laughs>